there are Guatemalans here, there are Nicaraguans here, there are uh, there's El Salvadorians here, there, there, there's so many different kinds. We, we aren't just a monolithic group. We're so many people. There's not just one way to be Latinx. One of the beautiful things about the Latinx list is that you have 10 writers who all come from different experiences. What drives you? What's that push? To me, my culture represents a North Star that I can kind of follow. Like, I'm trying to be the artist both my parents weren't allowed to be. They know how complicated it is being Latinx in this country. We've been here. We're indigenous. This is our home. I feel like now people are willing to pay attention. Marcelina Chibira and my pilot Macho Libre is on the inaugural Latinx TV list and I'm here today with J. Elijah Cho who's going to ask me a few questions. How do you feel being Latinx informs uh, your writing? My relationship with my Latinidad is complex. My father's Mexican, my mother's white. I don't look particularly Mexican. My uh, name is very odd. So when I was presented, people didn't know what to do with me. A very common experience that mixed people have is the where are you from game. Like, yes, the, what, the reason why I look like this, the reason why I sound like the way I sound, the reason why my name is weird is because I'm Mexican. That's what you wanted to know. So that was odd for me, and I don't speak Spanish. My father didn't speak to any of us in Spanish while we were growing up. When I got to college, I studied the performance of ethnicity and how people perform what they are. Do you feel like you're performing more for, uh, like you mentioned, the other white students? Oh no, the sign. <laughs> yes, it did. Uh -huh. my hands take two can you discover that moment of being proud of being latinx yeah i i've always been proud of being mexican and i grew up going to eagle pass visiting with my abuelita i'm named after her um doña marcelina i've always been very proud of being mexican even when i was in the all-white schools like i would make sure people said I was never Marcy, I was Marcelina or, you know, Marcelina. But even though I was proud and even though I love my the Mexican side of my family, I did still feel that disconnect. Well, it took me until I was about 30 to actually feel it. I understand my Latinidad from an academic perspective, from a psychological perspective. Like, I understand it. It wasn't until I got into the Latinx comedy Pachanga that I was like, I am being seen as Mexican. Now, I just am. I can just exist and people understand it and they, they know my story because they've lived it too. They know how complicated it is being Latinx in this country. Like, because we were here, we've been here, we're indigenous, this is our home. It was being seen. I was finally seen. Um, yeah, and I didn't have to explain myself, I'm sorry. Um, good, you're good. <laughs> when I write, the context of the situation has to be explained, but the characters are self-explanatory. And like the, the story is self-explanatory. So when I write, yes, the dressings will have Latinx elements, but every story is a human story. What would you say are the underlying themes of Machu Libre? In Latinx culture, toxic masculinity is such a phenomenon that we coined a word for it, machismo. The subtext or the supertext of my pilot, Macho Libre, is that Max, being this new kind of Latinx man who, whose fathers have taught him to be in touch with his feelings and taught him that it's okay to just be yourself and still be a man, is going to come head to head with the embodiment of machismo, a very strong, aggressive luchador. 
I grew up watching my male family members trying to live up to what it means to be a man and watching them try to live up to that is heartbreaking. I don't speak to my father very often because of issues surrounding machismo, but he wasn't an immigrant to this country, but he had a hard time growing up as a Mexican in this country. And I do respect him a lot. I, I, I respect him a lot and I respect my brother a lot. Um, and they, they did have a good influence on me. They did. It's just, I don't like seeing them in so much pain. <laughs> so I don't talk to them very often. Maybe, maybe there's room for healing uh, now. But now that I've explained myself in non-academic terms, maybe my point of view will be a little easier to get across. But yeah, I'd say that my father is also um, a very positive influence on me. So, um, gosh. What, what are you, what are you, how are you doing? What do you think? Uh, how do you feel about how the Latinx community is uh, represented on in the media? Uh, we, we aren't very much. Just being able to see people who look like us and have names like ours on TV is empowering. Just as it's important to have women characters in positions of power. We are politicians, we're scientists, we're engineers, we're architects, we, we're actors, we're writers. We need to not only get more Latinx stories out there, we need to show the scope and the breadth of what our diaspora actually looks like. We don't just, we don't have a monolithic appearance. We don't have a monolithic point of view. We are very diverse. And, and talking with people in the industry, um, I'm hopeful. Everybody seems to be on the same page. Since the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matters movement has gained ground in, in mainstream, it has emboldened me to speak up about these issues in these meetings that I'm taking. And I'm finding that the executives that I'm talking to are listening more carefully now. I feel like I'm being heard. Well, those are all the questions I have before we finish up. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Thank you so much for being quarantined with me so that you could talk to me. No, this is lovely. <laughs> Happy Latinx Heritage Month. Cut. No, wait, I don't need sticks to cut. Thank you for celebrating Latin Heritage Month with us. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment on this channel for all things Hulu. All accents welcome. Acentos bienvenidos.